I'm on my way to Kansas and I'm supposed to deliver a talk to the whoever wants to hear it at this flying. And I've not done any study or preparation. When I do a talk or a speech, it's almost always improv. Like I just go up there and do it, just like my vlogs. Oftentimes I don't have a topic. I just look at the camera and start talking. So I thought I might do a little practice talk to you guys if you'll have it. If you don't want to watch this video, it's just going to be me driving down the road doing a talk about PPG thermal flying. That's the topic that they want me to talk about at this event. So I thought maybe I would do a little bit of preparation, kind of do maybe a practice run as it is. And the stuff that I share with the pilots at the fly-in, I'll also share with with you and the talks may not be exactly the same but I thought if I do like a dry run to the camera here that you might get something out of it just like the people at the fly-in might get something out of it I might get something out of it we should start with perhaps there's different things involved in thermal flying gear weather weather probably being one of the biggest things you know pilot proficiency skill level these are probably the three major ingredients to achieve a PPG a thermal flight. Let's just discuss the gear for a moment. Obviously, it's the topic is PPG. We're going to be on a paramotor. So how do you fly thermals on a paramotor? What kind of paramotor is good for thermal flying? Now, oddly enough, we're only using the paramotor to get up and to get redos. That's what we want. Most of the time, hopefully, it's gonna be turned off or at idle. Oh my Lord, there's a big dead pig in the road. So the actual paramotor itself, you probably wanna get something that is a, a low drag paramotor. Single hoop, thin netting, thin spars. If they have the aerodynamic shape to them, that's a plus. Uh, the propeller that's on there, big three blades, Probably not as good. You want a skinny two blade, short one if necessary. Uh, E-props tend to have a little less footprint into the wind than the helix. So maybe a short E-prop would provide less drag into the situation. Fuel tanks that hang down into the slipstream of the air, you know, that's gonna drag you down. These things are like, all right, she wants some money riding barrels. Go Jen. Turn that off, straighten out this curve here. I mean, go around the curve appropriately. Low drag is is going to be beneficial for anything you do when the motor's not actually thrusting. This stuff is absolutely necessary. Look, you can take what you got and use it and you're fine. Swing arms, the hang points, you probably want something that allows you to get a good weight shift authority, also a good feedback from your wing. The low swing arms, the straight arms with the soft shackles, I mean the soft connections that allow it to to weigh shift left and right, yet they're stable front and back. Those are probably real advantageous to get a proper feedback from the wing. Now, we're gonna be in turbulent air. If you have a high hang point machine, minimal weight shift authority, you're gonna get minimal feedback from the wing and that's gonna make it harder to learn what you're feeling. When I learned this, I was in the situation where I was doing mountain flying, thermal flying, and motor flying simultaneously. Now, obviously, the two things are intimately intertwined, except you don't have a motor when you're doing free flight. Free flight harnesses allow you to clip in right at the hips. It's a straight connection to the wing. There's no bars or arms or shifty things that get in the way. You're just, you're just hooked to the risers. And of course, we could go on talking about gear for days, but it's not necessary. If you're gonna do this and you wanna get something to do it with, you know, there's some advantages to having some aerodynamics, you know, low profile, low drag, and that's what you're looking for with a free flight harness. A pod harness will give you a whole point extra of drag if you have a fairing on it especially. Again, these things aren't necessary. If you're gonna be the serious thermal pilot, having the least amount of stuff hanging out is gonna be advantageous. So the wing, let's talk about the wing for a minute. Your daddy's motor wing that you're out there turning and burning with, that's got the reflex profile, is probably not the greatest option to try PPG thermaling with. Now you can do it, I can do it. It's, it's very much more difficult than having a classic glider that has a more of a lifty profile than something that has more of a speed, a stability profile. And that's the trade-off. You trade the efficiency of the glider for speed. That's how reflex wings work. It changes the shape of the wing. It goes faster. It's more pressurized. The center of pressure is moved forward in the wing. 
Whereas if you have a free flight glider, it's more spread out and has more of a lifty, trimmed back, slower profile. The more you fly, the more wings you try, the more you realize the differences in these things. But having a motor wing that's not very efficient is going to be very difficult to maintain uh, a slow banked turn into a thermal core, especially if it's not the greatest day. Having something that's sort of in between, maybe uh, what comes to mind and what I use a lot of times is a Dudek Universal. There are others, but that wing starts in sort of a non-reflexed classic paraglider profile, ENB rated. Ratings are not necessary, but if it's a rated wing, if they give it an ENB letter certification, it means it's been tested for collapse recovery characteristics, stall characteristics, turning, all the things that might come up in thermal air. You know, this wing has been certified within the weight range for it. Speaking of weight range, if you're way overloaded on a tiny little wing, you're just gonna be coming down the whole time. It's not the greatest tool. You can certainly go out there and fly in and out of thermals with it and it's fine and the type of flying that we're actually talking about there's there's two there's two sides to the coin with this now you could just motor through thermals that would be considered a ppg motor thermaling flying but it's not what we're talking about specifically in this lecture you know we're talking about taking the the tactics that we use for free flight and transferring those over to the motor so we're, we're trying to turn in the lift, we're trying to go up, we're trying to avoid contact with the ground, keep our glider open. Now if the thermals are strong enough to climb in, uh oh, wiping a dry windshield here. If the thermals are strong enough to climb in, then they're probably strong enough to cause some collapses. Obviously we're talking grayscale here, with from mild bumps to gigantic thousand feet a minute updrafts that you could get in and climb into the sky so so far up that you get cold. Speaking of that, attire, you know, what's your cloud base for the day? How should you dress? You know, that's considered gear as well. Your wing or your motor, your clothing. I like gloves. I like to carry a warm pair of gloves and I like to have a thin pair of gloves to not risk getting line burns if I'm, you know, clearing cravats and wings flopping around some situation, throwing a reserve. A reserve, there's another thing. Have a reserve, maybe two if you're in strong thermal conditions. The first one might get tangled up. Have an option, carry three if you own three. Some, sometimes I do it, most of the time I just carry two. I have carried three once, <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe if I was doing some advanced acro moves, that might be a thing. But uh, have your reserves, have your, have your draw. From the shooting community, we used to practice our draw more than anything else. If you can get your hand on it and get it out and, and aim the gun, you're gonna break the shot faster and more accurately than the person who is not trained for that. So when you have reserves, practice grabbing them. Don't, don't pull them out unless you want them, obviously, but just reaching down and getting your hand on the handle. Practice that move. You know, whether it's right, left, center, you know, do it, do it without looking. You know, you may be looking somewhere else and having to grab the handle and you want to be proficient at that. You don't want to think about where is it at and be fumbling around. You may be spun up at a high G load. You may be ripping and flopping and twisting and shooting and, and who knows, who knows what's going on. But be able to reach down and grab that handle without thinking about it too much. Uh, it should be a reactionary, a reflexive move. And that's, that's you know, the quicker you can get that thing out, the better off you're gonna be if you need it. What else for gear? So we talk reserve, harness, unit, weight shift authority. Um, oh, if you do have a weight shift unit, be sure to adjust your strap so that you have a really loose weight shift. A lot of people don't even know what that strap is. It goes across your belly on most of your modern harnesses, but that's a weight shift adjustment strap. If you tighten that thing down all the way, it almost locks your arms together where they barely move. That dampens the feedback. It dampens your ability to weight shift. I loosen mine all the way every flight. I, sometimes I undo it and use it as a tether for my phone even. It's not a necessary requirement. It doesn't, doesn't provide anything safety-wise. It just holds those arms together. That's what you're looking for. That's the purpose of it. Hook knife. I usually bring a hook knife. Not always, but again, if you're in a situation where shit's tangled up, what if you throw both reserves and they both get eat by the glider? What, what do you do? 
Well, if you have a hook knife, you could cut your freaking glider lines and let that glider go and maybe the reserves open up and let you come down nicely. So, hook knife, let's go ahead and call it semi-mandatory equipment. Certainly, if you had one and you needed it, what if you needed it and didn't have it, man? You'd be kicking yourself in the nuts. Same reason you carry a reserve. Not because you're gonna throw it every time, but should you need it, you got it. That's a huge thing. Hook knife, helmet, comms. If you're gonna do thermal flying the way that I'm talking about doing it, having a Vario that you can hear beyond the ear protection is gonna be huge. Something that's loud enough that you can hear over a motor that may be idling or maybe even running a little bit. A variometer that has some sort of volume that can get past your ear protection. And you do need ear protection if you're doing motor thermal flying because you're gonna be running the motor some. Personally, I like the cups that you can pop off and, and then push them back on. I pop them off and scoot them back and I can hear everything around me. It's safer. What if an airplane's coming and with a motor running, you may not can hear it. But when you're free flying, you can hear an airplane coming from, you know, a ways behind you. Like, oh, look, there he is. Traffic on the ground, you know, hawk screaming at you. There's things that you can hear when the motor's not running that give you cues maybe to what's going on with the sky. So being able to use all your senses is important. The feel of the wing, feeling, again, your senses, eyes, ears, smell. I've been flying along before and smelled barbecue and like, okay, air's coming up from the ground down there because I smell somebody's cooking. And then I immediately feel the turbulence get into the lift that's bringing up that barbecue smell. If you see where the smoke's coming from, then you can get a good visual cue on the angle. You know, just using your sense of smell. I've done it. But you think it's a visual only thing, but sight, smell, feeling temperature change on your skin. Try to just soak in everything you can when you're out there in an environment and just close your eyes and use your other senses if you're not tuned into them as well. And that'll provide you with a little bit of, you know, don't be closing your eyes and flying around, but you can practice this without flying. You can go into a field and, and look around at where the thermals are breaking off and the gusts are happening. And just close your eyes and listen. Listen to the way it hits the grass, the trees, you know, your body. You'll feel the wind hitting your arms, the hairs on your arms if, if you have hair, ladies. Everybody grows their own little miniature wind socks all over their skin. Most people have hairs. Use it, use it. You can feel what the air is doing just by using you know, your body, you know, it's the best tool you got. It's the strongest computer available is your body. But your body is part of the gear you're using to do this task. But electronics, a, a communication device, a phone, a Garmin inReach is something that I carry. The more communication you have, the better. Radios, a aviation radio, a ham radio, Garmin inReach, and a telephone. Those are the four communication devices I usually fly with if I'm going up to do a thermal PBG cross-country flight. GPS, that's something that could tell you your wind, your wind direction. As you do circles, you look where the headwind is. That'll give you a cue. That speed might change, the direction might change. Just a quick glance down, you can tell which way the wind is blowing just by what the slowest ground speed you have is. If your turn is established nicely, you just look for where the headwind is and you can feel it, see it. If you've looked at the forecast, you might have an idea what they think it may be. Winds aloft are something that's measured directly by balloon launches twice every day in this country. You get a really accurate picture of what's going on with the winds as they go up. As far as up in altitude, direction, strength, that'll give you a cue as to when the thermals break and turn a different way. Or maybe there's a shear layer where it's just ripping the thermals up, but below it, it's good. Let's talk about skill. Where do you start? What should you have in your back pocket before you tackle PPG thermal flying? First and foremost, you want your fundamentals solid. And you can develop your fundamentals on a paramotor very easily by practicing. I practiced incessantly my first year of flying. The first six months, I believe every flight I did, I shot five to 10 approaches, precision approaches into a target. Before I would take off, I would pick a good field to take off from, set up my wing bag as a bullseye in the field, and I would go fly and just do my, I would do a launch, do a flight, do all my regular flying that I was gonna do, but I would leave myself a half hour or so at the field when I come back, I never just came back and did a landing. I came back and I would do approaches. I would go over my area, go to idle, and then and then try to come around and come into that wing bag. Now I didn't do landings. I wasn't I could land okay. I didn't need to practice my landings, 
but I did need to practice my approaches. You know, I would overshoot at 100 feet, undershoot at 100 feet. At first, I was not very accurate with my with my motor off. I say motor off. Of course, you're an idle. You've got the motor in your hand. You hit it when you need it. And that's what you do. You let it idle. You do your approach. And you can see pretty much about treetop level whether you're going to hit it or miss it or how close you may be. And then you go around. You apply power, climb back up, come in from a different direction this time. Maybe you're going downwind, upwind, crosswind. But you go over your target at some altitude, maybe 200 feet, maybe 500 feet. You pick an altitude that's good for you know whatever your margin is. You go to idle and then you pretend the motor's not there and you purely try to fly the wing on a precision approach. Let's go back to gear, wind sock, required gear for thermal flying, personally speaking. If you're gonna practice at a field somewhere and do these moves, Landing during thermal activity can be, uh, you know, you can get smashed if you're not on your game. And you can practice being on your game by having a wind sock and looking at it and seeing what's coming. You know, I put it out ahead of me. I recommend two, maybe two launch distances ahead of you. Maybe one right there at wherever your spot is. That way you get a good read between the two. If they're both pointing the same way and nothing's changed, then you know in between them you got that good clean air that you can utilize for a safe landing or safe takeoff run. Learn to read your windsock. That's a that's a seminal skill for learning to understand the air and the sky. And that's probably where we're going last. But first let's just talk about how to approach it. So you've got your fundamentals down. You can land good, you can take off good, your forward kiting is good, reverse kiting is good. Now you don't have to be an expert, but you need to be proficient. If you're having fumbles and getting slapped around and, and messed up, either the air is too strong or your skills need to be sharpened up. It gets, it, there's an overlap where everything works and then you can go outside of bounds Maybe your skills don't allow you to, to kite in anything that's over 12. You know, maybe a, 12, a gust 12 or 15 becomes more than you can handle. And you lose. You lose. You get plucked, thrown, land funny, screw up the wing, get dragged. Lots of things could go down in that situation. But, but be on your game. Be practiced. You know, be proficient with the basics at a bare minimum. Then let's talk about what to do. Again, my personal situation, I was practicing mountain flying and PPG flying at the same time. I was able to do far more PPG flying than mountain flying, so I thought, why not combine the two? I had my basics down, I had my precision approaches, I was able to land, I was controlling the wing pretty well. I also took an SIV. It was not at first, the first available SIV was six months after I started flying. After I started doing mountain flying or motor flying, I started in October and I took my first SIV at the first of April. That was right where I needed to be. I was able to spot land good. You know, I studied the maneuvers, had time to understand the basics, the fundamentals. And then I did that. And when I did that, that guys look, if you, you know, anything after your very beginning basic training, SIV maneuvers clinic, once you have that, that understanding of what's going on and you're able to recover these gliders when they fold, when they're stalled. You know, you can do a stall, you can backfly your glider, that'll blow out a cravat if it's a terrible situation. You know, if you don't have to throw a reserve, if you've got these in your back pocket, you just, you just do the move, right? It's the best bit of training that you can buy after your initial how to fly training that there is, period. And if you're gonna do thermal flying, I recommend to immediately as soon as you get your fundamentals solid, go find one, travel to go one, make it a vacation. Don't be intimidated by, you know, they don't they don't tow you up and then tell you to do a full stall. Everything, if it's done right, is is it's practiced, it's studied. You practice the maneuvers in a simulator, the flight is spelled out. We're gonna go up and do this, this, and this. We're gonna start by collapsing just a little wingtip, like a big ear, and we're gonna lean away from it, see what happens. You know, and then it gets a little bigger, and then you approach the big moves in a stepwise fashion. Maybe it's day two or three before you're doing stalls and spins and recoveries and spirals or sats or anything you want to do. The SIV environment, the maneuvers clinic environment, is one of the safest places that you can do these things, and that's why we do them there. Over water, safety boat, flotation, hook knife, structure in your ear telling you what to do, whatever you pay for it, it's worth doing. If you can get a good deal on one, probably still worth doing. 
as long as the environment is safe and the instructor is you know up to snuff on it you're going to get a lot out of it and it's going to be very advantageous for your safety for your confidence you're going to have this confidence in your gear hopefully in your skills that you won't be in a panicky i don't know what to do situation you're going to make the right moves they're thought out they're practiced you've got a little muscle memory you know you know what a glider feels like to fly when it's halfway open you know a quarter a third of the way open you understand the way these things feel and what you're capable of doing to, to control them can you can you collapse 50 percent of your glider and then turn in a direction away from the collapse and maintain a turn you can learn that in siv so if you lose half your glider you could turn away from it and you know at least fly straight while you work out the situation now once i had all this and maybe even before it slightly you approach thermal weather in a stepwise fashion just like anything you start on the days that are really nice hopefully you have somebody around that that knows the weather that can teach you you know even advice on the internet you know go to your local facebook group you know whoever's in your area doing free flight you know ask they could tell you so they either say yes or no i mean when you weed out the naysayers it's like oh you shouldn't be asking if you have to ask you can't do it but maybe there's somebody that can help you just determine you know what you know is it going to be good before 11 you know what what's it looking like before 11 you know maybe you want to land by then mornings are typically more dangerous to start practice with because the day is on the uptick you know if you try from your 10 to 11 hour just try entering thermals flying around the motor gives you an opportunity that you don't have if you're only free flying if you're just free flying you go up at 10 maybe you don't connect you bobble in and out of a few of them and you land game over got to go back up to the top of the mountain repack re, you know relaunch with a motor you get a redo and you're going to take some redos that's that's how i learned that's how i learned to thermal i'm still learning to thermal it's learning i love learning i love teaching i love sharing but you start in in earlier in the day later in the day the reason mornings are not as good is because the conditions are on the uptick and when it comes time to land things may be getting very rowdy near the ground and the ground is what hurts you in this sport the air will not hurt you it might scare you but it will not cause injury the ground can break you to death so stay away from the ground if you can if you have to get near the ground to land if the thermals are really romping and stomping keep your motor running be ready to do a go around it gives you that opportunity read your wind socks on your approach if they're doing something stupid that you don't like go around their cycles rarely is it just junk for the rest of the day there will be cycles amongst the junk that you can take and that are good so you set yourself up at a safe altitude where you know you could maybe get your reserve out quickly if necessary if you get smoked by something ugly if you see the windsock doing something on the ground you probably are feeling it right back where you're at because again these things are leaned over so be, be weary in the morning like if you're approaching it from the calm into the rough it may be better at first to maybe start earlier in the afternoon you know your four or five o'clock hour when things are still rowdy but they're on the down tick so you can go up and deal with the rowdiness and then come down and land in the nicer conditions and it's safer to do that launching in thermals is going to be easier than landing in thermals because you get to pick when you go if you're clipped into the wing and you're waiting and you're being patient like a good pilot should be then you're going to have this opportunity to pick when you go you don't always get to pick when you land sometimes the motor's dead sometimes it dies you know sometimes sometimes you have to land you know what if you throw your reserve you're gonna have to land i think it's safer to start later in the evening at first and then you can start doing the mornings and practice 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 when it's mild maybe you're not even doing climbs yet maybe but with the motor there's there's a couple of ways to do it now at first you probably just want to leave your motor running and have your vario where you can hear it and you're going to approach these thermals feeling the wing you want to kind of ignore the motor if you have a cruise control this is the perfect opportunity to set that cruise control like on a on a level setting you know low low jet only just where it's sort of negating the drag of the glider and the harness and the cage and the hoop it'll push you and give your wing a higher performance than what it actually would be if the motor was dead 
and that's helpful you know you can get in lighter thermals and climb in them with the help of a motor but what you're feeling for is the edges of the thermals the turbulent areas and so if you go into one and your vario is beeping you know you'll hear the uptick in the beep if you can count to three try to do a turn in it practice go in the thermals try to turn and climb in them go out of them if you start getting low go hit the motor go back up get go up again once you're able to, to, to maintain contact with the thermals, where the Vario's beeping all the time, not just because you're thrusting, but because you're actually climbing and staying in the thermals, then you can start killing the motor. Now, you want to be able to re-crank your motor mid-air, and that's, uh, if you can't do that, killing it is your, your free flying now. You got one shot at it. You either do it or you have to land. Always keep your bell out. Free flight pilots always keep their bell out, hopefully, that's the way to do it. Motor pilots should always keep their bell out. Hopefully, that's the way you do it. There's no difference. So if you're flying safely, you've got your bell out all the time. No matter what it is, you pick something that you know you can hit, and you can hit it. That's where the old practice thing comes from, the fundamentals. Being able to nail spot landing. Crucial for doing this activity safely. So environment that you practice in, just study it, look at it. Pick a spot that gives you some options there. Where do we go from here? Boy, this is turning into quite the, quite the show here, huh? What do we wanna do? We want to, so we've done all these things. And when you get to a point where you can restart your motor, you can practice restarting your motor without doing it in thermal conditions. I like those little ladies because they push enough to give me what I need. I can kill them and they start real easy. I can reach back with one hand still on the toggle, pop it, and the motor can crank and it's easy. The motor is a little more difficult. I usually have to get two hands on it. If I'm gonna do a recrank, always give myself a strong margin. 500 feet on a strong day, minimum. If I'm not cranked up below 500 feet and I have to use both hands to crank it, that means I gotta let go of my toggles. If I let go of my toggles and I'm busy cranking the motor, maybe I punch out of a thermal or a dust devil hits me and my glider shoots, folds, collapses. You lose control. I don't want to let go of those controls below my margin. Whatever I set for myself, a calmer day may have a lower margin. A stronger day, maybe it's higher up. You know, your floor that you don't want to go past. That's important. So if the motor don't restart, well then again, you can't trust your motor. That's that's always the name of the game. If you're trusting your motor, you're messing up. You're not doing the sport right. I don't trust my motor. I don't trust any motor anymore. After the unicycle accident I had the other day, that thing burned up on me, threw me off. I wasn't going wildly fast or anything, but just falling straight down was enough to wreck my hands, my knee, my shoulder. Thank God I missed my head. Ain't got much IQ left at this point, so. I hope, I hope I save what little bits available to me. Once you're able to kill your motor and hop from thermal to thermal, do climbs all the way up to 500 feet below cloud base, thought out all your safety stuff ahead of time, gear is in place, water and food. Sometimes you go up there for several hours. You know, if you're doing a true free flight, you know, bring your, bring your water. I like these Geiger bags, they're, they're the best ones that I found, you can, you can pump up the, I'm not, I don't work for them, not sponsored, but I've been through a lot of water bags and the Geiger bag, Geiger rig, that's the one you want, I gotta recommend it. Well, having a glider that's dedicated for this sort of thing is gonna be optimal. You know, you can get your weight loaded near the top of it, you're not way overloaded. I like my gliders overloaded a bit if it's a high performance glider, but you don't need a high performance glider. You know, a good B-Wing is gonna be uh, what you want. That's a, that's a great place to start when you're learning, feeling. It's got performance, it's got safety built in it. You can grow into it. But once you're dead serious about it and you're making all the moves, good to go. Speed bar. Speed bar is a double-edged sword with a paramotor. You put it on, if the sister clips come undone, it goes into your prop, wrecks your stuff, it happens. I've had speed bar come undone three times in the last seven years. Thank God all while free flying without the motor, but every time it just, it catches me like, whoa, how did that happen? Well, it just bounces through the little clip. It's just, you know, Murphy's Law. So something I like to do when I'm motoring is before I even get my gear ready, I, I, I take a couple pieces of tape and I put them on my clothes. And then when I clip into the glider and attach the speed bar, I'll take that piece of that tape and I'll pinch it around those sister clips. 
so that it holds them from coming undone. Now just motoring, I don't usually use speed bar, but if I'm gonna kill it and go thermal hopping, you want it. It's a tool that you wanna to learn to use. And again, these, these things you practice, you approach them slowly. Try your gear out in good air, and then you bring those skills with you over to the bouncy air, the lifty air, the turbulent air. And there will be turbulent. Weather is gonna be the biggest thing. The biggest thing that you can do is pick good weather to practice in. Not too strong, not too weak. There's a sweet spot. You don't get a whole lot of days in a lot of places that are the sweet spot. If you have flexibility with your work schedule and you can just up and go at a good day, that's when you do it. Try to look the day before so that you can get your gear sorted out kind of the night before, get everything charged. Don't go overdoing it on the beer or the damn cockfighter whiskey. Nebraska, y'all hear me Nebraska? Josh Bowden, be careful with that stuff or it'll hurt you mentally and physically for sure. It's weird, it's weird. The air and the sky is a variable place and it has many, many things that it can do. And I could talk all night about what you want to look for. Some of the basic things I look for on a good day is mild winds on the surface, seven to 10 to start with, well, seven, five to 10 would be a good range of surface winds. Allows you to kite in any of those conditions. Um, thermal updraft velocities, six to 700 feet a minute updraft velocities. That'll allow you for some solid climbs, you know, 300, 400 feet a minute climbs. If you do catch an edge, you might only get like a 30, 50% collapse of your glider. Probably a full frontal if you just let the thing shoot out of the thermal at a sharp edge. But you can prevent these things. When the glider goes to shoot, you apply brakes quickly sometimes, but then you have to release the brakes. Once the, you stop the glider, you gotta swing back under it. So you release the brakes, keeping the glider in the sweet spot. Right where you kite it, that's where you fly it as well. So if the glider's there, you'll be in a gooder, a gooder spot, gooder. That's a word now. I think we can make up words now. It's 2020, you know, it don't matter what the dictionary says, we're gonna make up our own stuff. So it's so much gooder if you can do that. That's really the end of the story. You do these things, you get the gear set up, you practice, 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 practice. First your fundamentals, then your advanced or intermediate techniques, your active flying, I just, I just can't, you know, don't overdo it. You don't put your blindfold on, put handcuffs on your legs and feet, and then, uh, you know, grab a bowling ball and jump in the deep end of the swimming pool. That's wrong. You'll end up hurt or dead. And you approach, you know, thermal flying the same way. You start in the shallow end, you know, the baby pool conditions, and you work your way up stepwise. But yeah, that's it. That's basically it for the talk. I'm gonna cut it here for the dry run and then go on down the road. My finger's about numb from holding this camera up. Sorry that it's just a me talking, driving down the road video, but hey, if you watched it this far, then I hope you got something out of it. I'm gonna try to deliver a solid talk about this to the people at the fly-in. Uh, this was just a good practice run. Kind of gave me an idea of what I want to say, how I want to say it. We'll go from there. Hope you enjoyed it. Much love, everybody. Kyle out.